The economy and inequality. There are two issues dominating the political landscape as we approach this year's midterm elections. And more and more, it seems, the two are directly connected. And after a long and certainly a difficult recovery, American businesses are, by most metrics, doing well, in some cases almost, if not just as well yet again. But most workers at those same businesses probably wouldn't echo that sentiment of success. And part of the reason is what some experts are calling a quote-unquote war on workers, laws and trends that aid businesses at the expense of their employees. But another way, businesses are squeezing out more profits by putting the squeeze on those same workers. Now let's get some background from a senior political correspondent, Andrew Whitman. Well, Rich, this is a trend that has been an ongoing one since the downturn of 2008, but it was put on steroids by the 2010 midterm elections, in which Republicans gained control of the legislatures and governor's mansions in 11 states. And as profiled in the New York Times piece this weekend, those GOP-led state governments used cookie-cutter pro-business legislation, often copied from one state to the other. The result? that those states proceeded to rewrite the rules of work, passing legislation designed to enhance the position of employers at the expense of employees. And they did so with legislation that, quote, consistently favors employers over workers, tilted towards big government over local government, and often abridged the economic rights of individuals. The examples are both numerous and frightening for workers. Rewriting the rules for unemployment insurance, forcing the unemployed to take lower paying jobs or lose their benefits barring municipalities from issuing local raises to minimum wage rates, easing restrictions on when and how children can work, allowing businesses to pool tips beyond waiters and others who rely on them, which then allows businesses to qualify more workers for sub-minimum wages, often less than $3 an hour, loosening the laws mandating overtime pay, tightening the rules on labor unions from how they're formed to how they receive their dues, and by banning efforts on the local level to require paid sick leave. The result? Not just business environments where employees can be paid less, but also environments where employees complain less, fight less for more pay and benefits, and act, as the author of the Times piece put it, docile. Rich? Andrew, thank you very much. Now, you may have seen some recent reporting on the quote-unquote war on workers. In fact, it was profiled in Sunday in the Times editorial page. It's a piece that was based on a report by the University of Oregon professor Gordon Lafer. And for more, we are joined via Skype by the aforementioned Dr. Lafer. He has written widely on the issues of labor and employment policy. He's also the author of the book, The Job Training Charade. Mr. Lafer, thank you very much for a few minutes. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. You know, before we even get into what we're seeing on the state-by-state -state basis, put in political context for everybody what could be at stake this November in the midterms as it relates uh, to the American worker. Well, really, since uh, Citizens United allowed unlimited corporate spending in politics, we've seen a sea change at the state level, not just the federal level, um, where, where a tremendous number of state legislators are now being bankrolled by large corporations that have their own particular agendas that are also bankrolling state think tanks. And to a large extent, their agenda, unsurprisingly, is to end up with more money in their pockets and less in the pockets of the people who work for them. So, you know, in, in any given state, we've, you know, depending on small margins, can end up with dramatic changes in what the laws are. To that end, what you found in your research um, was that if you look carefully state by state, a lot of the laws that have been changed, they really have a familiar pattern to them. We talked a little bit about ALEC on the program, but put in context where, as you said, there's a cookie cutter element that we're seeing here. It's part of a, uh, I, I guess, a broader mosaic that this is all going in one direction and they all have a lot of familiarity as to what they're doing. I think that's right. I mean, the pattern gets really dramatic when you see both the same things happening in different states and similar, you know, related things happening in the same state. I think most people, when they hear about a law to say, oh, we should have a, a lower minimum wage for teenagers, think it's the idea of some local legislator and that it's a response to the particular economic conditions of their state. In fact, for the most part, these laws don't come from anybody locally. They come from national corporate lobby and they're part of a package. When you see, oh, it's not just lower wages for teenagers, the same people want to abolish the minimum wage 
They want to abolish prevailing wages for construction workers. They want to bring in more guest workers to the country. They want to have more child labor, more teenagers doing the work of adults. They want to abolish the right to paid sick leave. This is a very big, ambitious agenda, and it's being rolled out to the extent that they can get it passed in every state legislature across the country, regardless of what the economic conditions are, in places where things are good and places where things are hurting. If I could put a face on it for our audience, talk a little bit, for example, in Wyoming. Um, I mean, anybody who's worked in the food service industry, I've waitered, I bartended, and the rest, you, you kind of knew the compact. If you didn't get minimum wage, um, you at least got to keep your tips. The idea that you'd have to pull your tips and it goes for everybody in there, talk about that because I think for people at home, they can wrap their arms around that. Right, so under law, under federal law, if you're a waiter or waitress, you only get $2.13 an hour in minimum wage and you supposedly make up the rest in tips. Uh, Wyoming proposed a law backed by the by business lobbies, which would have allowed employers to force those tips to be pooled with all kinds of other people, you know, working in the kitchen, and then declare those people tipped workers also and pay them two thirteen as well. So, in other words, the money that waiters and waitresses earn gets taken away from them, given to somebody else to allow the owners to make more money by paying them less. And then, They're, and then, if I could, to put it in context. They're probably one of those states that has minimum wage restrictions they're trying to pass. And we already know factually, don't we, doctor, that a lot of them don't even make minimum wage when it all gets added up. Well, that's right. I mean, supposedly, if you're a tipped employee, and there are about 4 million people who are waiters and waitresses, mostly adult women, um, you know, in theory, if you don't make minimum wage, you can complain to somebody. But the truth is, there's no easy way to do it. And if you, if you have 500 bucks or a thousand bucks that you're missing, which is a lot of money for people trying to make ends meet. And they say, well, hire a lawyer and go into court. It could cost you much more than that to hire a lawyer. So effectively, you have no redress. And one of the, you know, there, there have been some places, not states, but individual places, like Miami Dade County in Florida created a model wage theft ordinance. It's very streamlined. It works kind of like small claims court. And it's all paid for by business, so there's no cost to the taxpayers. They said, here's a simple way to file a claim if you were not paid correctly. In the first year, they recovered almost $2 million in stolen wages. And the response of the Restaurant Association and the Chamber of Commerce was to go into the legislature and push a law that would have made that illegal and would have banned any other city or county in Florida from having creating a mechanism for people to get back stolen wages.